Hey, my name is Ben, and today on this episode of How to Make Everything Practical, we're talking about the natural act of lactofermentation, which is the natural act of bacteria fermenting cabbage, peppers, ginger, radishes, and carrots into the traditional South Korean kimchi. You know, kimchi comes in all different types and flavors. What I've noticed is that they usually start with a nice fresh Napa cabbage, get started chopping it right up. Aside from Napa cabbage being the first ingredient, the most important ingredient is the salt. So the salt is what keeps it crunchy and inhibits the growth of bad bacteria which can make your kimchi go bad. We're trying to make a dish that is both fermented, tasty, and can sit on your counter for a long time or in your fridge. Feel free to use uh, your salt liberally. I haven't had too many problems fermenting, but when I do, it's usually a, uh, I didn't use enough salt. So for me personally, I've noticed that it's easier to go um, to save a ferment that is too salty rather than trying to add more salt at the end. So maybe use a little bit more than you uh, feel comfortable with. You know, you should taste your ferment as you go and it should taste uh, noticeably salty but not overly salty. So this is a traditional food of South Korea. This is my own personal version. I like to do uh, the Napa cabbage here. And secondly, we'll be moving on to using some nice radishes. These ones come from uh, Wisconsin. It's really important to use the, the freshest produce you can possible. And you'll notice that you get a much higher quality, much more high quality product in the end. So you know, feel free to just toss out anything that's wrinkly or brown or broken up. What's nice is uh, the recipe is very flexible. So you can cut your veggies into whatever size you like. So feel free to go coarse, fine, whatever you like. If you've got a cheese grater, you could use that. What's nice about the red radish, uh, and the reason I use it, is it does give the, the kimchi a nice pink hue at the end. We're going to be tossing in a little bit of this daikon radish also. I, I rarely see a kimchi recipe without daikon in it. Uh, that's one of these nice white roots that you can pick up at your local grocery store. If you have trouble finding it, ask the produce clerk, because you might have it in a hard to find spot. And again, you just want to make sure that you're getting your salt level well distributed in your cabbage and veggies here. You don't want to have pockets of oversalting or undersalting. That can lead to some problems down the line. Also a really important is you want a, a non-reactive container to ferment this in. So I personally like to use either a ceramic crock like we have over here. Uh, maybe you have seen one at the antique store or in your mom or grandma's basement. Non-reactive is really important because you know, your final product is going to be you know quite salty and quite sour. and uh, so you don't want anything that could corrode or add any impurities into your kimchi. So stay away from using a stainless steel container or a plastic container. If you are going to use plastic, use something that's food grade, please, because we don't want anything gross leaking into our fermented product. You know, this is something that's going to sit for, you know, minimum a week and uh, even up to six months in some cases. Or uh, I've heard of ferments going for an entire year. Mason jar works really well, which is what we're going to be using today here. As you add the salt and mix it up, you're going to notice that it's going to start to uh, pull out the water out of the cabbage and the radish. So it'll actually start to drip. As you can see there, I've added no water to this. This is just the action of the salt uh, breaking down the cell walls and pulling the water out of the cabbage. So, you know, once you start seeing that water dripping as you pull it up, that's a good sign that you've got a nice salt ratio. You really want to avoid oxygen. Oxygen is really one of the reasons your ferment will go bad. So, you know, maybe you can use a wooden spoon like I'm using. Maybe you're using a fist. Um, just make sure that you're stuffing it really far down there. Um, that's really important uh, for the ferment, the health of the ferment. I like to make layers as I go just because it looks really nice. And uh, as it ferments, you can kind of watch it and see the colors change. Some people like to add a starter to their kimchi. You know, you might want to go grab a jar of Bubby's pickles or maybe you've got a batch of kimchi in the fridge that's been going for a while and you can add a little bit of the juice from that into your ferment to kind of give it a kickstart, but that is unnecessary actually. The bacteria that process your cabbage and your radishes are actually naturally present in the garden. So if you don't have any, anything fermented around the house to start with, you can just chop it up like I'm doing and it will start to ferment in about two to three days uh, without the use of a starter. Next ingredient in our kimchi is going to be, um, I'm going to do a kohlrabi just for uh, variety. I like to add a nice root vegetable. Sometimes I'll add a, an extra turnip or uh, possibly a rutabaga if I've got one. This is just kind of to add to the general flavor of the kimchi and texture. Personally, I find the more variety, the better result you get. 
but you can make a kimchi with something as simple as just some carrots, uh, radishes, uh, ginger, and cabbage. Next, we're going to add some spice. So here's some jalapenos here. A lot of people like to use maybe a habanero or um, serrano peppers. Today, we're going to be using a jalapeno just to kind of keep it on the mild side. You know, not everybody likes a really spicy kimchi. You know, maybe you want to be able to take this to uh, a family dinner or maybe a picnic or something, and you want to be able to share it. So keep that in mind when you make it. Of course, if you're making it just for your own personal consumption, I mean, feel free to throw a ghost pepper in there or two if you really want to. Um, that'll make it pretty exciting. I'm doing this without gloves, which is a little risky. So, you know, if you're handling a lot of hot peppers at once, if you're making a big batch, you might want to consider putting on some latex gloves or um, something similar because is it, anybody who's worked with hot peppers knows it can get pretty spicy pretty quickly on your hands. There we go. I want to be adding salt as I go to these things just to make sure that we have an even salt distribution in the ferment. There we go. Should be just enough. I also picked up some of uh, these nice hot wax peppers. You know, these just looked really nice. Again, I wanted to have as much color as possible, so having a little bit of yellow would be really nice in this ferment. Pretty sure these are locally grown also, so I always like to have stuff from around here in our ferment if possible. The temperature is another really important thing to consider when you're making any type of ferment, kimchi especially. Um, you know, in the hot summer around here, it can get up to 90 degrees, you know, for an entire week. And uh, as anyone who's studied chemistry knows, uh, a rise in temperature means a rise in the speed of the reaction also. So if you're fermenting in a hot place, um, you want to keep an eye on your ferment because it, it's going to ferment a lot faster than it is in the, in the wintertime or somewhere cool. You might have a ferment that's finished in a week and it will be nice and sour at the end of a week in the summertime, but in the winter it's going to be a little different. So keep that in mind as you're fermenting. For me personally, I ferment for about Three weeks typically uh, is what I have found to work really well for my kimchi. Uh, again, that gives it enough time. All the flavors start to really combine, all the colors combine. It gives the bacteria enough time to really create a lot of lactic acid. You know, lactic acid is the primary preserving acid in this sense. So that's what gives your kimchi or your sauerkraut a really strong sour tang to it. A lot of people think that you're adding vinegar. It's actually uh, lactic acid, which has the same pH as vinegar, so it could, it could see why you would get confused. But these bacteria are uh, lactic acid producing bacteria, hence the name lactofermentation, which is the process in which we're using here. Next, I want to throw in a carrot. That's a really important part of the kimchi for me, both in terms of color and for flavor. Uh, these ones are super nice, hard to beat this. I'm going to put in some pretty big pieces of carrot because I, I like pulling a nice big crunchy piece of carrot out of my kimchi. And, you know, these are going to absorb the flavor of the ginger. It's going to absorb the, the spiciness from your habaneros or your ghost pepper, or in this case, hot wax and jalapeno. Other root vegetables you could use, um, you know, radishes of all kinds, turnips. Um, I've used some really nice white turnips. That's turned out really nicely. And we're going to put an onion in here as well. This onion looks really nice. Um, also, leeks can be really good. Also, ramps, uh, which is a form of wild leek, is a really um, kind of adds a, a really nice stinky aspect to your kimchi if that's what you're looking for. Take a look for those at your local farmer's market or if you're out walking in the woods and your kimchi might benefit. And again, always with the salt. That's the most important part. Keep the salt ratio about even. Uh, your type of salt is really important also. You know, a lot of people have trouble with iodized salt and I recommend against that. So if you can find a nice uh, non-iodized um, fine grain salt over here, I've been using, let me see here, um, the canning salt. So that has no additives whatsoever. It's just pure NaCl. I've noticed that the iodine can actually affect the uh, fermentation process on a bacterial level. If you think of uh, antiseptics, a lot of them are iodine based. You know, that's an antibacterial. So we're doing our best to encourage microbial growth uh, not deter it. So please, you know, keep an eye on the salt that you're using. I wouldn't necessarily use whatever is in your cupboard. You might want to make a special trip to the store for that one. So you can see here, you know, this is uh, really juicy. You can see the brine is starting to come up. Um, that's a really good sign that everything's working out really nicely. The salt is pulling the water out of all these vegetables and they're actually creating their own brine. So when you're doing this, you shouldn't have to add any water to your uh, ferment as you're going. 
unless your vegetables happen to be pretty dry and stored for a long time. In that case, um, you might want to throw about a quarter cup of salt into a quart of water. That seems to be about the right strength for me. And just pour that over the top of your ferment if your veggies aren't juicy enough like these are. That does bring me to the important point of uh, you always want to keep your veggies below the brine level as they're fermenting. That's extremely important. You know, we're talking about an anaerobic process here, so no oxygen involved. Uh, exposure to oxygen is actually going to degrade your ferment and uh, possibly ruin it. If you're using a crock, you know, you may want to use a, a nice stone or a plate to hold your veggies down under the brine level. Or uh, what I like to do also is use a smaller mason jar in the mouth of a large one. And uh, what I do is just make sure that uh, any floating bits of veggies are pulled off the top of the brine there, because those, uh, that can lead to problems. Next is the ginger, a uh, really important part of the kimchi. This really adds a lot of flavor to it. And uh, it's one of the first things you taste when you try it. You could feel free to make it into matchsticks if you like. I'm going to use a grater just because I really like that distribution of ginger throughout the, throughout the ferment. I've also uh, had really good luck with grating horseradish, fresh horseradish into my ferments. It doesn't quite have that uh, kick that a fresh horseradish does. Uh, as it ferments, it kind of mellows out and lends its flavor to all the other veggies. Let's try to use every little bit of ginger here. This stuff's really important. Really valuable, really healthy stuff. It goes right in here with the rest. I'm going to do my best to kind of just mash this around and get it into all the little nooks and crannies here. The moment that you uh, cover it with brine and let it sit, uh, the magical action of the bacteria begins and they start basically digesting all these vegetables. They're a byproduct of these uh, lactobacilli and other Bacteria is again lactic acid, so it's a very simple process that leads to a really tasty result. Uh, that's what's really nice about it is most of the work is up front. You know, we're doing the chopping, the washing, the prepping now, and uh, then you put it into a jar and then it's waiting from there. Uh, you may have to kind of pull a little bit of uh, white scum off the top every now and then. That's just a, a, a harmless yeast off the top of your ferment, so don't be afraid if you see that. If you see any colors that aren't uh, beige or white, um, or if you see something that's like fluffy or fuzzy, that could be a sign of mold growing on your ferment, um, in which case uh, I would recommend starting fresh with a new batch. However, I have never had that problem, and I've been fermenting for about five years now. I've only heard about it from other people. So if you're using sanitary conditions and enough salt, and you're careful about having your veggies underwater, you really shouldn't have a problem with spoilage. If you do notice an off texture or an off flavor, you know, use your common sense. If you're following the steps that I'm laying out here, you should be able to have uh, an excellent tasting ferment in about three weeks. Put in maybe just a couple more uh, pieces of pepper and onion. We should be set on this ferment. So again, we've been making a really tasty kimchi here, the national dish of South Korea. Anyone who's traveled over there and I've talked to a lot of people who have can tell me that they are just absolutely crazy about kimchi in South Korea. You know, they uh, sometimes will even have entire refrigerators in their house devoted to just storing kimchi at the right temperature. Lacto-fermentation is inherently a very safe method of preserving. You may know about canning or drying. Uh, this is a very safe way to do it. Basically, um, botulism cannot survive in a, either a salty or a very acidic environment. And uh, you know, th this is a very salty and it becomes a very acidic environment. So this is not a, a ferment in which uh, botulism is going to be an issue. In fact, uh, a ferment is going to be healthier or safer than even the raw vegetable itself. I mean, think about you know, some of the problems we've had with E. coli have come from unwashed uh, produce. And in fact, when you're uh, preserving like this, correctly done, the acidity is going to uh, kill off those pathogens as well, as I understand it. So this is a way uh, that the ancient people used to not only preserve their food, but to also make it safe to eat as well. So I'm going to throw in uh, just a couple more carrots and onions here, just to top it right off. Uh, again, you're going to want to get all the oxygen out. There we go. Stuff it right down. You know, don't be afraid to kind of mash it down a little bit. Everything is going to get kind of fermented and soft, and all the flavors are going to kind of mix around. So, plus, you also want to be breaking down those uh, plant cells and drawing the water out. So, 
a little bit of smashing is actually really helpful in kind of getting the brine up to where it's supposed to be here. There we are. So this is a nicely layered kimchi here. You've got your carrots there, the onions on the top, jalapenos a little bit further down. So at this point, what I'm going to do is I've got my food safe uh, plastic mesh here, which I got from my friend who works in the restaurant. This fits really nicely into the mason jar here. It sits below the neck. So for me, again, really important to have the veggies below the brine. And uh, this works really well to keep the floaters from floating up on the top. You're always going to get a little bit of uh, floating vegetable matter on the top there just because you've been chopping stuff up. I like to use just a little strainer and pull it off the top just to make sure that there's no vegetable debris. Because again, that's where, uh, that's where things start to go bad is where the veggies touch the oxygen there. What you're going to want to do also is put a, you know, maybe a paper towel or a, some cloth over it just to keep bugs out and to keep dust out. Those are two things you don't want really messing with your ferment. So uh, put it somewhere dark. It doesn't really like direct sunlight either. The ultraviolet rays can affect the process. So uh, somewhere dark, somewhere relatively cool, and uh, let it sit. It will start to bubble in about three days, and uh, your house will start to smell really, really good. And that's when you know that the magic is really starting to happen with your kimchi. Just keep an eye on it. And uh, to be honest, it's ready whenever you consider it to be tasty. So try it every couple of days. And once you get to a nice kind of sour level that you prefer, you pop it right in the fridge. Um, one thing that's convenient about the mason jars like this is you can just throw a top on it right away, put it in the fridge, no problem. If you're, you're going to be using a crock, it's a little different. You will have to kind of repack it into smaller containers and refrigerate it at that point. So um, I, I do recommend using a, a mason jar like this one. Take this knowledge and make something tasty for yourself and your community. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe and check out other content we have covering a wide variety of topics. Also, if you've enjoyed these series, consider supporting us on Patreon. We are largely a fan-funded channel and depend on the support of our viewers in order to keep our series going. Thanks for watching.